you have to be okay with at least many failures. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a more impactful and profitable architectural practice. If you've ever been frustrated that you can't find the product data that you're looking for, you might be using the wrong search engine. Broad searches result in consumer products, out-of-date information, and websites that oftentimes may hide or not have the information that you need at your fingertips. If you need specifications, CAD, BIM, etc., RCAT.com is your search engine. Find and download the up-to-date product data you need fast. RCAT.com is free, requires no registration. So go ahead and try it today. That's RCAT, A-R-C-A-T dot com. And today I'm joined by the illustrious Alex Gore from F9 Productions and the very popular podcast Inside the Firm, amongst others. Alex, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you. You're you're an old friend by this point. Absolutely. I love I love actually the story about how we met, and uh, it was so beautiful uh, the way the way that that rolled out. And I think it's a great example of your mindset, which is something we're going to touch on today. The idea of mindset, the idea of changing our thought patterns, how our internal world affects our external world. But do you mind sharing that story about how you came across me and how we first met in person? Yeah, you so, came out here to Visalia, where I live. I did. Uh, I was visiting my wife's parents for the first time, had to ask them to, you know, if I could marry my wife and all that. Um, and, and I knew about you and, and some, I don't know how I knew you were in California. And then I just looked up where you're at and it was the next town over, you know, it was maybe 25 minutes, something like that. Um, and what's weird is that for some reason, I'm not the most generous person. Um, but I, like I, I, I was just at Montana. Uh, giving the AIA convention, there was three keynote speakers. And I don't know if the guys listen to this or not, but I'm like, I want to give them a gift. Like I want to get like, their speeches were so cool. I feel like I learned so much. And the same feeling, this was, who knows, was it 10 years ago that we did this? Probably. It must have been. It must have yeah. been about that. Yeah. So I just emailed you and I said, I was in the area. Do you want to meet up? And you're like, yeah, yeah, let's meet up. And we had coffee. Um, and I gave you a little pen. Um, you know, it's a nice little pen because I just wanted to to say thank you, um, and and that's how it that's how it came to be, and, and and I feel like even I should take this more, like I should actually go get those guys gifts and and, and send them to them. Um, often I do not, so I'll tattle on myself. Uh, but it's a I feel like it's appreciated. It, it's kind of like if you ever give a speech in public or teach, you know, a class and people actually ask a question. You feel so good, like, oh, you're listening. You have an actual question. So knowing that that feels good for me, I, I want to give that back out. I love it. I love it. Beautiful. Uh, that, was, that, was, that was a really great experience. Uh, it was cool. And this was before you had all the accolades and the public recognition of the huge personality that you are. Now, you were still a huge guy back then, but you were just a little bit less known. I, I think but, uh, I, you're being too kind. You're being too kind. I, I was, you know, just an architect out of Colorado back then, and I'm an architect out of Colorado right now. I love it. I love it. Well, as we were talking before this episode got rolling, we were talking about our own personal growth trajectories, kind of catching up on what we've both been up to in our own worlds. One thing that I learned very on, Al, when I started the business of architecture, since we're talking 10 years ago, right, 10 plus years ago, was I went into my mindset going into interviewing other architects, consultants, thought leaders, I thought, you know, if I can only figure out what it is that they're doing, then I can replicate their success. So I thought that the key was in acquiring some sort of special knowledge. Like if I just had the puzzle, that like if I just could unpack the things, what are the A, B, C, D, E, F, G things that I needed to do? And very, very quickly, I suddenly realized that it wasn't about the A, B, C, D things. Like those things were important and sure they happened, but there was something underneath that and it was their approach to life. It was the way they saw things. It was their perspective. It was how they viewed life. In other words, their mindset and their thoughts, like what they thought about the world. So I'll give you one example to spark the conversation here. Five or six years ago, I had the opportunity to sit down with my top interview of all time that I've ever wanted to do. It was like, I wanted to get Art Gensler on the podcast. I'm like, man, oh, if I can just get M. Arthur Gensler on the podcast, dude, that would be so epic. He's like the yeah. titan of architectural business from what he's created, you know? As a matter of fact, I was out there in your neck of the woods in Denver for the AI convention that year. 
And Art was doing a pre- – actually, it wasn't the AI convention. It was another event that the AI had put on. And, uh, and Art Gensler was doing a presentation there. And I thought, now's the perfect time. So I scheduled. I, I called the office. Uh, they hooked me up with an interview, in-person interview in their Gensler Denver office. We kind of were in a little corner while he was visiting the office. I had the opportunity to interview him. But the one thing that stuck out with me, because I'm thinking, how did this guy go from basically being a sole practitioner to having – a company with 4,000 plus employees, 40 offices around the world doing the kind of work they're doing. It's impressive. Now, of course, there's a number of, there was a lot of fortune that happened in that. In other words, like when he started his practice, they went through several booms. They went through the office interiors boom, which was his niche. So certainly there was some fortunate wins behind his sales that pushed that forward. But what I know is there was a lot of other architects at the same time that's had those very same fortunate wins. But what was the difference that allowed Gensler to grow into the behemoth that it was, as opposed to these other firms that stayed small, and identified was one simple thing: it was that Art was not afraid to let go. Okay. So what do you he mean? Val- he valued he valued business, and whenever he wanted to grow the practice, he did it. He wanted to give people opportunities. He's not he's not an egoic guy. Like if you sit down with him, he's a tall, towering, commanding presence, but he's very like when I talk to him. I was just some unknown podcaster to him. He didn't know who the heck I was. Maybe I was someone from a local TV show. Here's the guy. He's the founder of a billion-dollar architectural business. He's accomplished a lot in his life. And he was just very unassuming, very down-to-earth. You know, he's like a salty earth type of guy. And I could tell in the way he talked with me. So as he recounted the growth of the firm, he talked about how people would like people would kind of reach that point in the firm where they wanted to grow and they hit a glass ceiling. And he'd be like, hey, you know what? We're, um, um, this was when, the, when he was in San Francisco. Like, yeah, we're doing a project out in Denver. What if we just send you out there to start up a new office? And yep. so they kind of grew like that because he was willing to give people growth opportunities. So the key here is that it's not, it's not the tactic would be sending someone and starting a new office, but that's not what drove it. What drove it was art's inner essence of wanting to empower other people. So it was his thought and his mindset around that. That's amazing. Um, let me see. Yeah, it was these guys, HDG Architecture. Um, it's a very, one point is similar. They're not as big. They're a smaller firm. But uh, one of the ladies in the office said, I'm sick of uh, people putting their regular furniture in our awesome, amazing architecture. And I'm, paraphrasing you know it was more nicely than that said and she had the idea that she wanted to start uh an acquisition and furnishing and fixturing you know portion of the business and the leadership said yes we will help create it fold it in you know you get a percentage of it and we'll make we'll make this happen so it's it's the same thing of just empowering and then knowing yourself as an employee in the firm you can bring these ideas to your leadership. And if you have good leadership, they should allow you to pursue those. They should be able to let go of where you're at to let you grow into what you can can become. Absolutely, you know, and like you said, it's it's the it's the internal operating system of these leaders, right? If they wanted yeah. to hold the reins so tightly, if they didn't trust her to to bring that business forward, if they felt threatened by it or if they thought it was a stupid mm-hmm. idea, you know, let's face it, some of them probably thought it wasn't a great idea. But they said, hey, let's do it anyways because their trust in her and their, their desire to help someone grow was greater than their own doubts. Yep, yep. And that goes back I into, okay, so uh, the I mentioned before I was in Montana at the AIA Billings uh, sort of convention. And one thing I talked about was uh, the concept of theory, you know, in running a business. Theory before principles. Principles before processes, processes before tactics, right? Because I have to judge when someone brings an idea to me or doing something, how does that fit in the reverse? Like if it's a tactic, how does that fit into a process? If it's a process, does it align with our principles? And do our principles align with the theory of how we operate? And I feel like that's where essentially it's it's hard for business owners to let go because they might someone might bring up something and they might say, this doesn't align. And I have to make a business align because if not, it's just going to be too hard, too chaotic, too scattered. And I say that as an encouragement is that what if your idea does align? You're just not presenting it 
in the correct way or they aren't being able to process it. So if, if your business culture does have practices and theories, it's a good way to say, hey, this aligns with what you're doing. I'm just taking it in, in a new direction or a bigger direction or expanding it. Yeah, great point. Uh, Al, you were, you were, we were talking earlier and we were kind of talking about our own mindset shifts over the past few years. And you kind of brought up this great point. You said, you know, the crazy thing about it is that when we change internally our way of thinking, no one around us sees that. Yep. Right. So we yep. could have some massive shift in who we are, but like other people, we're still the same person. Yep, and you and, mentioned and an, a, something about an experience about that. Yeah, yeah. So I'll um, I'll give a business experience, right? Okay. So so Lance and I were talking about um, it was a focused on 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 design for like this specific area that we're going, and we talked and and you know we are good, and and he kept he kept bringing it up, he kept bringing it up even like months later, and I had to sit him down and said. I go, what are you, what are you talking about? Like, why are you bringing this, this up? I go, do I need to copy you on emails? You know, do I need to, you know, like, so that you see that this is happening? Like I made this shift months and months ago and there's been many moments in my life where like I make a shift or someone else makes a shift and we don't announce it. So like, it was actually a little literal question to Lance. Like, am I not letting you know? Because imagine, imagine, that, you know, like this was, I was more Christian in high school than in college, got less Christian and now, you know, mature more on the Christian route. Um, but I had friends who saw me in college, after college, that were my high school friends. And I say a cuss word and they're like, oh, I thought you were the Christian guy, you know? Mm, and yeah, every time they, you, yeah. yeah, every time you make this, these changes, I just had a, a personal thought with, with, you know, family and all that stuff. And I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to treat things like this right? And I, um, let's say it's playing more with your kids. And, and this one, I, I don't even know if I told my wife that I'm focusing more on playing with my kids. She might see it, you know, but, but what, what if, what if I made that mindset shift that I was going to play more with my kids, but I wasn't able to implement it yet. Unless this wasn't a contentious issue with, with our relationship. It was just something I wanted to do. But what if it was, and she was like, you need to play more with the kids. And I already made up the mindset and me knowing me, I already put it in the calendar and I can see that in, in two weeks, I'm going to be more free and that I actually, I'm going to surprise them and I'm going to come home on a day that I'm not supposed to come home. Right. But you don't, and you tell me this, I don't tell everyone every time I make a mind shift life shift in my life. I don't, I don't text you, you know, can be like, Hey, just to let you know, bud, you know, I I've changed yeah, yeah. this. The Yankees are going down the pot, man. I've abandoned them. We're going all yeah. in on. Yep. Yep. So I want to know what you think about that. Like, do you think that that's true with most people? And, uh, what, you know, do you think the premise is true? Uh, that people shift and, and just don't tell people. And then we're all living oh, yeah. in, in these people's past. You know, yeah, absolutely. And you know, one of the one of the most challenging things, if if you're on a fast track of growth, if you're really accelerating in your life, uh, I, I'm speaking to our listeners. I'm speaking to you, Alex, but also our listeners. If you're if you're on a path where things are massively changing for you, uh, because maybe there's a belief system change, maybe there's a different way of looking at business, maybe you have a new fire under your ass because you have some passion that's coming forth, and you're like, man, I got to pursue something different. This isn't working for me. Like this is happening internally, or let's just say in a relationship. Let's say that you mature as a person. You have a different way of showing up with your spouse or your partner. You know, well, oftentimes the unfortunate, difficult, challenging thing about growth is that other people still see us as that previous version of, of ourselves, and they treat us as that previous version. And the power of someone treating you as something else is very, very powerful. As a matter of fact. You know, they've shown, sociologists and psychologists have shown that if you treat me a certain way, Alex, I will kind of settle into more of that way of being. Yep. Right? So if yep. you treat me as aggressive, as mean, I'm going to be more aggressive and mean. If you treat me as smart and brilliant, I'm going to rise into my smartness and my brilliance if you do it in an authentic way. So the challenge here is that if we're trying to change sort of character flaws that we have or different or bad ways of being that we've been in the past, and now we're trying to be like a new person with our teams, with our 
with our spouses, with the people we care about, we show up and we're like, I'm a different person today. And they're like, no, you ain't. You're the same person you were last year. And they're going to treat you that way. There's like this inertia I found that like, because it can get discouraging when those people still treat us as that other version of ourselves. So that's, that's how I've experienced it. Alex, how about yourself? I think, I think actually this could be a huge issue in, in business. So imagine that you have 10 people, 20, it doesn't matter. You have a hundred people working for you and someone's going to take the initiative. And let's say they're a year or two years into the firm. They learned from you how to do stuff. Obviously in the beginning, like you just need to intake and just understand what's going on and then execute. And let's say you make the internal changes. Hey, I'm going to start taking a leadership role. And maybe, maybe you start emailing the client more or doing stuff like that. And maybe the first five times you do it, that person, let's say, you know, you're in charge, like you kind of override them and not meanly, yeah. but you just like take over the conversation or, or, or just add on more tasks. Like, let's say they said like, Hey, you know, landscape architect, do this, do this. And you just override them all of a sudden, just like you said, they just get pushed back into the, I'm just a worker bee. I'm just a worker bee. And it's probably because like, they didn't communicate that if they would have said to you, you know, hey, just let you know, do you feel like it's the right time for me to start taking on more responsibility and taking on more of the communication? You would probably say, great, awesome, awesome. But instead you are treating them like their past self, you know, just like any any one of us can and, and often do do. I love it. I love it. And, and it, you know, it brings up something so important for cultures. I'm glad you brought the business back into it because like trans, like honesty, honesty in a, in a company culture is essential and lack of honesty will kill a company culture. So in your example, let's say that mm. uh, you probably both you and I in our past experiences in employment have experienced that where we, we start taking more initiative. We start doing things that are a little outside our comfort zone. We start trying to exert some more leadership and then we get, I don't want to say push back down, but basically we don't get noticed and our, our superiors, the people above us, um, continue with the old ways of operating. We're just like kind of taken away or maybe, um, how did you put it? You put it so eloquently, overriding us, you know, yeah, making different decisions. Yep. Un- unknowingly, unknowingly, just because they're, you know, they're, they've always done, you know, it's just it's just the old pattern. No no big deal, nothing wrong with it, right? Um, but from from our perspective, that can feel, it can, if it can feel just very discouraging, it can feel disheartening, it can feel like, oh, there's no, there's no room for me at the company, I can't grow. Now, here's yeah. the thing though. In a powerful culture, if that's happening, the person like the job captain, let's say there's a job captain, a project architect. Yep. The job yep. captain could go to the project architect and have an honest conversation, which is simply yep. this. Hey, Alex, I, I, could we have a second to meet? And they're like, okay, great, meet. Okay, great. Hey, I just want to share something with you. And and this is just all on me. I don't mean any offense by this, but I, I value our relationship. I want I want to you know be the best team member I can. And I want to let you know that a while ago I decided to, you know, kind of take on more responsibility. And that was a decision that I made. I didn't communicate that to you. But recently when you overrode uh, what I did in that email to Landscape Architect, you kind of switched that around, you know, that that hurt my feelings. You know, it felt like I was being overridden. It felt like, so I just want to, I just want to have a chat with you about that. Yep. These are kind of conversations generally do not happen in business. They don't. They don't. And 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 you could say, uh, just let you know, I wrote that to the landscape architect, you know, and 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 you chimed in, and I just want to let you know that I'm trying to do this, and that, is it okay for me to keep doing this? And I can then, and here's here's the thing too, because it's so hard. People are getting better and better, but it's hard to take criticism, right? Um, so like a a good way a good way to do it for that person would be. Do you want me to come to you first in while I'm transitioning to make sure if you have any input and then can I write it? You know, because they might have, hey, make sure the landscape architect doesn't forget about the stonework or, you know, whatever it is, right? And then from a leader's perspective, here's what, what's hard about it too, is you have to be okay with at least many failures, right? So for example, um, a project that was going on, uh, you know, I asked the team, hey, what did, what did you want to do? And this was the, the construction thing. And they're like, well, we want to do it this way. And, and I had a different way that I wanted to do it because it was going to be more structurally sound. It was bookcase work. It wasn't, it wasn't anything too serious. And it was for our own 
own area, right? Anyways, if I dictated absolutely everything, every fastener, every connection point, every whatever, I'm going to have to do that forever. I'm going to have to do that forever, right? And they won't know, and, and I am making it quicker and easier for them. Like, hey, do it this way instead of that way, right? Um, but now it's like, oh, they did it their way. It was less sturdy. Maybe next way, not only should I make it more sturdy, but I should think about that as a principle. You know, like, what is the strongest way to do this? You know? Um, and the other way, too, is I could I could just say, you know what? I just always need to dictate <laughs> the fasteners of a bookcase and all that. How, you know, like, okay, is that is that my ceiling then? You know, is that is that where I need to be involved in in every project? Probably not. You know, probably. Yeah, not. yeah. I can imagine you just pulling your hair out. You know, just okay. <laughs> once again, this is the fastener we're using here. What kind yeah. of fasteners would you use in that application, by the way? I would use all thread and stick it right into the stud and and cut off the hex and then put the bookcase right on top of it. Beautiful, beautiful. There's a little. If anyone wants to chime in on the technical feasibility of this approach, you know, email yeah. podcast at businessofarchitecture dot com. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just don't even buy. Enoch will take all. You take all yeah. the. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Yeah, um, you know, it, two things come up here, right? Communication, um, and also what I find in lacking in business nowadays is like a real conversation about about emotions and like emotional impact of things. Emotions really matter, and we tend to make business so dry. But what happens in that regard is that there's no emotional connection between people, right? Now yep. I don't know how I phrased it at just a couple minutes ago, but if I was speaking with the superior. It might be a bit confronting or it might direct, but I might say something along the lines of, yeah, you know, that, that hurt my feelings. And I know that wasn't your intent, but I just want to let you know that, you know, I'm kind of hurting over here. Yep. Yep. And when hey, you take that approach with people, it opens up opportunity for powerful conversations. Yep. Um, can I tell you one thing I, I'm trying, how I'm trying to think about mindset and mindset shifts? Yeah, let's hear it. And then I would love your take on it because I think it becomes a furial, you know, like, oh, what's your mindset? You know, what is yeah. that? Yeah. And think about it as like I do. This is just internal. And we're I'm just talking is what's your position or positioning? So like everyone knows football. Everyone kind of knows how the army works, right? Like if I'm going to mind shift, am I now becoming, you know, the sergeant of a small squad? Am I becoming like the lieutenant of four squads? You know, am I becoming the captain of a battalion, right? It, it, whatever analogy you want to use, you know, football, am, am I just the tackle? Am I the running back? Am I the quarterback? Am I the positions coach now? You know, like, am I, um, th that's a great one. You know, like, am, are you the tight ends coach that's trying to now be the offensive coordinator? Are you the offensive coordinator that's trying to become the head coach? So think about the difference of roles of an offensive coordinator and all the X's and O's. And the head coach knows that, and they might they might even call plays. But the head coach has to deal with media, marketing, players doing crazy stuff, ownership, leading the other people, leading not just the offensive coordinator, but the defensive coordinator. Who's below them? Who's going to hire when they leave? You know, like, so... That's what that's an easier avenue for me to think about is how am I going to shift my mindset? How am I going to shift my position? What's an analogy that I'm going to shift my position into? Is it is it a more loving father? Is it a is is it a better husband? Is it a expanding growth firm or is it it is it a, a quality niche boutique firm? like what position am I going to put myself in and what what mindset do I have to have to execute that correctly? Yeah, beautiful. I, I love it. I mean, you know, just in terms of being like a more loving father, let's say that I have the, I want to have the position of being a more loving father. I need yeah. to figure out what stories or thought patterns do I need to tell myself mm -hmm. to actually be a more loving father. And you can reverse engineer those and then you can figure out what those are. So for instance, let's say that I currently believe that the best way I can show up as a loving father is providing for my family. And so I'm working 10 hours a day. My family rarely sees me, you know, but hell, I'm being a great father. You could, and that right. could be an absolute answer at that stage in your life, yeah. right? Could it not? Yeah, I think that's where kids. you're going. Well, yeah, except for the kids. How are they yeah. feeling? 
<laughs> yeah, like it but, depends on from whose perspective do you want to be the loving father. <laughs> no, no, I I agree, and I think you are going to. There are different levels, and and we could say quote unquote higher level. But if you are extremely poor, and you have no money whatsoever, and and no one can get a job, and maybe this is in a different economic season, you know, than it is now, and you're like, I'm I'm the dad. I'm going to work 14 hours a day. My wife's going to stay at home and and take care of the kids, and it's not the best, but uh, other places are, other people are begging for food and, and in shelters, and we are in a home, and that's my job right now. And then later, you might change positions and change mindsets. You grew yeah. in that firm, right? Now it's like, oh, now I can manage. Now I can level up, so maybe I only have to work eight hours, and I can come home and coach baseball, you know, whatever it might be. Beautiful. And both of those examples are driven by a core belief or a story about what should be done in any circumstance. Right. Yeah. So, for instance, the example you just gave, the story is that I'm going to be a better father by providing my family so I don't have to live in a shelter. Yeah. Right. Totally valid. Yeah. Totally valid. So going back to our main topic of today, yeah. our stories determine our destinies, our internal thoughts, the way we think about things. I love how I never thought about it the way you did, the, this idea of position. I'm going to have to noodle on. It's a great frame for it, like yeah. dealing with roles and like how to shift and all that. It's fantastic. Awesome. Love it. Love it. So our invitation for you, listener, today is simply this. You know, wherever you're at in your career, what what I've seen, and Alex, you can confirm or deny this, but what I've seen is that your acceleration, your growth of your practice, of your business, of your own career is only going to go as fast as your mindset expands. I Alex, absolutely what do you think? agree. Absolutely okay. agree. What, what do you think? What's the vehicle? for uh, accelerating that or growing into a bigger mindset. Yeah, there's there's a lot of different modalities. And one of the most powerful that I've experienced, I mean, there's a lot. There's um, the work of Byron Katie is great. People can look that up. Uh, it's fantastic for rewiring your stories. There's the work of Tony Robbins is fantastic. Uh, I just had a guy on the podcast earlier today that I recorded an interview, which will probably be live by the time we do this. Um, but the reason why our thoughts stay the same is because our brains about the time we're 18 years old, the neural pathways, they stop forming new connections. They just rely on the existing connections and the existing pathways, which means that if we have the same pathways, we have the same thoughts, okay? So something yep. drastic needs to happen to change the pathways. That drastic thing can be, it needs to include emotion because if you have a, a massive emotion, the emotion will shake up your brain chemistry and cause you to allow new brain connections. For instance, your dad dies and suddenly now you have a new lease on life because you're like, wow, I don't want to waste the rest of my life. I'm a complete shift here. Like we see I'm people have these moments of grace. I'm going to change from 14 hours. Yeah. From going to 14 yeah. hours yeah. to eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. You know, it's like, boom, because there's some grief, some emotion, something powerful that happened. Now, sometimes life just hands us these things and th that's like grace, right? It's just grace. I have no control over it. Just something happens in my life that causes a massive shift. One thing that psychiatrists are discovering now is that psychedelic drugs or medicines, as they call them, mm -hmm. can do this very same thing in a therapeutic setting or with the right set and setting because they shake up your brain chemistry in a positive way and they allow you to create new neural brain connections. So this yep. is very cutting edge right now. It's like new within the past five to 10 years. This has really started to explode. But if you want to change your stories, the fastest way you can look into psychedelics and pair that up with a conscious intention of identifying the stories that aren't serving you and then replacing them with new programming or stories that do. Absolutely. Yeah. Where, where do you go get this? this? Yeah. You, when are we going to get together and do some psychedelics, man? You tell me, bud. So there's... <laughs> How about... <laughs> Let's do that off the air. Okay. <laughs> if I know, <laughs> hypothetically. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, Alex, good having you here. Awesome. Thanks a lot. It was great catching up. And that's a wrap. Oh, yeah, one more thing. If you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show. If you've ever been frustrated that you can't find the product data that you're looking for, you might be using the wrong search engine. Broad searches result in consumer products, out-of-date information, and websites that oftentimes may hide or not have the information that you need at your fingertips. If you need specifications, CAD, BIM, etc., rcat.com is your search engine. 
find and download the up-to-date product data you need fast. RCAT.com is free, requires no registration. So go ahead, try it today. That's RCAT, A-R-C-A-T dot com. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.